as we begin, I would first like to recognize that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome our co-moderator this morning, Yogesh Gori, who's a senior program staff at the Cody Institute uh, here with me, as well as the number of panelists that we have. And uh, that includes Alex Paul, our friend, uh, at the executive director at the Mi'kmaq Economic Benefits Office, Kelly Henderson, executive director with the Trucking Human Resource Sector Council Atlantic, Linda Thomas, director with the YMCA Nova Scotia Works Employment Service Center, located in Dartmouth and serving HRM, and also our MP, Sean Frazier, uh, the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Finance and Minister of Middle Class Prosperity. We're very pleased to see all of you with us here today. Um, I would first like to introduce our speaker, Arija Eldarahali, who is with Simply Cast, uh, one of the new opportunities for work, a, uh, a three-year labor attachment program employer working out of Halifax Regional Municipality in Nova Scotia, Canada, uh, to share her story around the impacts of COVID-19 in relation to the future work and workers. And we're very um, pleased that she is able to be with us today. And you will notice that there will be a blank screen as she comes in to tell us her story around the impacts of COVID-19. And so at this time, I will, I will pass the microphone over to Arija El Darahali. Okay. Uh, good morning, Jamie. Thank you so much for inviting me today, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Adige elder Helly, and I'm the HR Manager at SimplyCast Interactive Marketing Limited, uh, located in beautiful Silicon Dartmouth in uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, so SimplyCast is a customer engagement platform with over 25 channels of communication that are compiled into one platform, plus we offer um, a platform that can be used for emergency situations called Emerge Hub. Uh, Simply Cast entered the pandemic with 30 employees, and we currently have 32 plus an additional three more uh, joining our wonderful team next week. Uh, even though COVID-19 has impacted our bottom line, we are proud to say that all of our 30 employees um, have remained on our team, and uh, we've added uh, five new additional team members. Um, our team is made of diverse individuals from uh, all over the world, and uh, who have shaped Simply Cast into what it is today. Uh, we've worked with organizations uh, like Autism Nova Scotia, the NOW program, uh, St. Mary's Accessibility Program, among other programs, uh, to provide individuals uh, who face barrier to employment um, a place to work uh, due to a disability that they would have. Um, and our, our team has uh, looked past uh, individual differences uh, because uh, everybody is unique and uh, that just makes our uh, a team uh, a wonderful team. Um, so a lot of people that have joined our um, organization through some programs are actually leading our department and uh, they've been with us for five plus years. Uh, we will also hire students from local universities uh, from Waterloo, Dalhousie, uh, Cinevax, Acadia and um, uh, most of an SCC um, which is a college in Nova Scotia and um, a lot of those um, team members have actually stayed on because they've enjoyed uh, working with us. Uh, so SimplyCast recently became an ISO certified organization uh, with the help of our amazing team and uh, the different procedures that we have enforced actually helped um, SimplyCast during the pandemic as we were, we were, we were prepared uh, to work remotely from home if an emergency situation was to arise. Um, our team has always been productive and we, we knew that um, if they transitioned if we transition the team to work from home uh, for their safety during the pandemic, that they would continue to support the organization and adapt to their new work environment. Um, we kept our office open during the pandemic and asked um, only four of our employees uh, to work from the office. And um, so they worked from the office uh, to make sure that um, we worked through any hurdles that arise um, when we moved our team uh, to work from re remote locations. Um, our team, uh, to engage our team during the pandemic, uh, 
what we did is we created a COVID-19 group on Teams to allow our team uh, to share pictures of projects they're working on or share pictures of the baking or um, meals that they've created, uh, just to make sure that we're creating dialogue with our team and not leaving anyone alone um, or um, making sure that everybody's kind of connected to each other. Uh, we also implemented daily status meetings to make sure that the team had a chance to speak to one another during the day. And we also asked our team members to check on um, other team members that, um, that live alone uh, so they don't feel that they're um, disconnected from the world. Um, and we're hoping to plan outdoor events um, as restrictions are lifted once, um, yeah, once restrictions are lifted so everybody that's working from home can come back and, uh, and gather with, with each other. Um, we recently posted two positions for the Canada Summer Jobs to hire three individuals between the ages of 15 to 30, and um, we received an overwhelming response, uh, even uh, maybe double or triple the amount of uh, responses that we would uh, have received before the pandemic. And uh, this indicated that a lot of uh, bright individuals are currently unemployed and eagerly looking for work. Uh, we received applications from local candidates as well as, well as from around the world. And uh, as much as we would have loved to hire everyone, uh, we were only able to um, hire five individuals or um, two individuals to the program and two individuals um, just uh, without any uh, funding. Um, so SimplyCast compiled feedback uh, from our team and uh, to determine who wanted to stay uh, to work from home or who would like to return to the office. And the majority of our team actually requested to continue, work from, uh, to continue working from home as uh, it saved on the commute time and it also gave them a better work-life balance. And um, the pandemic showed us that we have a great team that is willing to work hard from the office or from home. And um, that allowing our team to continue working from home is uh, actually a great thing for everybody. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to hear your story and to hear about the innovations that you're using at SimplyCast to, to cope with and grow through uh, COVID-19. We certainly know there are folks uh, from all over the globe who are on the call today and the, the contextual differences and impacts of COVID-19 will be uh, some, somewhat similar in certain circumstances, but also very diverse in terms of what those impacts look like. And uh, so we hope that folks, as we're going through the call, will also take some time to reflect on their local communities and the impacts of COVID-19, but also those innovations and stories of, of hope that are coming through. So we certainly appreciate you sharing that with us this morning. And at this time, I would like to pass it over to Yogesh Gore, our Senior Program Staff and Lead for the Inclusive Economies work at the Cody International Institute. And he will be facilitating the next few moments as we introduce our speakers. So over to you, Yogesh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamie. And thank you for your leadership and support in putting this very distinguished uh, panel of experts and leaders uh, today. And, uh, and it's just nice to see the level of engagement, uh, over 300 people uh, interested and, and participating. So this means that we are, we are talking about the right topic uh, that is of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. um, again, um, uh, <laughs> I'm actually originally uh, from India. Uh, I came to Nova Scotia in 2008. So actually, uh, this is my 11th year, actually this month. And, and one reason that actually attracted me to, uh, to Cody and Santa Fax uh, was, uh, was the university's uh, uh, public mission uh, to serve the local community, uh, the local region, and through the Cody Institute more broadly, globally. And, and, and what it actually means is that uh, you work with the community on the most pressing issues that affect the community uh, during the time. And uh, I think the history that I learned here about what happened uh, almost 100, 100 years back when the university went to the community uh, and, and, and started talking to people about the economic challenges the communities were facing uh, uh, in the 1920s and the 30s. And 
through those dialogue, uh, uh, which was almost a catalyst in starting a conversation how people can use their own resources to overcome their challenges, uh, became a, a model that was celebrated not, not only locally, but globally. And we still mm -hmm. uh, carry the, the spirit of that uh, movement and, and in our education, that's what uh, we continue to teach. So I think that was one of the things that, uh, that attracted me. And I think that that is what connects to what uh, we are starting today. So just let me give you just a, just a very quick background why we are starting this conversation today and, and why at Cody and why at Sandifax. So I think if we, if we call the time we live in today is extraordinary, it would be an understatement. We are actually in a very uh, uh, extraordinary times. So what we are going to do uh, uh, today is, is to see this, this extraordinary time from a couple of angles. One, is the current movement of, of the COVID uh, crisis. As the previous speaker told, like what it actually, uh, how this is going beyond the, the health crisis, how it is actually uh, affecting the, the way we live and, and, and the way we work. So we will look at, at COVID, but even before COVID, uh, uh, there was one more uh, big trend that was affecting everybody, including this region, is the whole um, area of future of work and future of workers, how technology, how climate change, how mm -hmm. uh, rapid urbanization, uh, changing demographics, the, these major forces were disrupting uh, the way we live and the way we work. So how actually uh, this added um, crisis of COVID, how that has uh, uh, changed uh, the future of work and future of workers. So we are actually in today's conversation, we are going to focus on these two angles. First of all, looking at the impact of COVID and then what it means for future of work and future of workers with specific focus on what it means for different segments of the population in terms of equity and inclusion. So, and as, as uh, uh, what happened 100 years back, uh, these were kitchen table meetings. So these were not expert conversations where uh, some experts are speaking about specific topic. I'm not sure whether God is there or not. When I came here as a student, one thing he told me that you have to demystify uh, what, what, when you talk to people. So instead of talking uh, income and expenditure, how about we use a leaky bucket and inflows are, <laughs> or inflows are all the income and expenses are all the holes in the bucket. So in a very simple way, we will, uh, we will have this conversation like a kitchen table, you're talking to your grandmother. So I'm going to start by asking uh, each panelist um, a very simple question, uh, maybe some personal reflection on what this uh, moment means for them. So just give us a, a glimpse into your world, uh, what this um, moment of COVID means for you personally, what it means for your work, how you might have to, you, you may have to change uh, certain priorities. So just, uh, just tell us uh, about this particular moment. So can I start with you, uh, Linda? Linda, your mic is off. Linda, just, just turn on your mic. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. It certainly is a different world, this world of COVID. And every day my partner and I say to each other, who would have thought the world would end up like this? It's like it's upside down. And that's in my personal life, it certainly is. And it extends into my professional life, my world of work. Um, it's, it's just changed the, the, the whole game. Um, we're, what it has done uh, for me personally, it's challenged me to step up and be more um, open to change, more um, open to um, moving ahead quickly and um, working differently, definitely. Working uh, virtually, um, being challenged with um, being able to provide services to community without missing too many beats. So um, it's, it's been challenging, but it's also been um, a teaching experience for me. Uh, can we move to uh, Kelly? So Kelly, you represent uh, uh, an industry that works with many industries. So how how this has been for you personally as well as for your work um, thanks you guys and thanks for uh, inviting me to be a part of this panel it's very exciting and i think it's uh, very innovative to think forward 
uh, on uh, on these on these challenges that we've been encountering. And I love how Linda started off how it's uh, it's uh, been challenging. And who would have expected that we would be where we are today? Um, you know, given where we were four months ago. So, um, so from my perspective, I work with the Trucking Human Resource Sector Council, Atlantic. Um, and basically what we do is we work with the trucking industry on all their HR issues. So whether it's driver training, whether it's uh, industry standards, whether it's the image of the trucking industry, there's a wide range of things that we work on, um, you know, for the betterment of the industry, for the betterment of workers that are in the industry. Um, and so when I think about COVID, you know, as an organization, um, we definitely, we, we, like many people, started working from home. Um, you know, we're doing remote working. We're basically still dealing with and still supporting our industry. Um, for those who probably heard, and, and certainly um, uh, as we move forward, I mean, trucking was a big part of the essential services that were keeping things going, keeping the economy going. And so for us, things didn't slow down. Um, they definitely kept a uh, uh, fast pace. Things were changing on a regular basis. Um, we were really impressed with even some of our sector, uh, some of our industry people were changing as well. Uh, at a time when four months ago, we would have said, no, we can't do this work from home. And now, you know, they're, they're evolving into this is something that we're doing and we're doing it successfully. Productivity is increasing. We're not seeing the, uh, the challenges that people expected. So it's definitely been something that uh, I think it's been eye-opening and, and it's been, you know, it's been great to be a part of the industry at a time when they are getting the recognition, I think that maybe sometimes it gets missed uh, at different times. So that's really where, I guess that's where I'll be coming from today. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's in, in, interesting, like some, uh, the, the way you were saying that, okay, you actually got more busier <laughs> uh, <laughs> in, in this time. Okay, can I uh, go to uh, Alex? Hi Alex, can you just uh, tell us your window? <clears throat> well, um, I think that's, uh, I think uh, a couple of the, the panelists uh, have been talking about like kind of what a strange place this is now. And, uh, and I'm just going back to kind of uh, being referred to as, a, as an expert. Um, and that's how bizarre this time is, is that I can be on a panel and considered an expert and a leader in any particular subject matter. Um, so the, the impact for um, the, our organization um, we're very fortunate. We have a highly educated, um, very motivated uh, group of, 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 um, of employees, and, uh, and we happen to be doing a lot of our work over the years remotely anyways, from going from various sites, uh, doing monitoring, visiting projects that we're on. So um, I think that prepared us well. Uh, to first of all, for me, kind of as the lead in the organization, be able to trust people to know that their productivity won't stop. And, and, and at a particular time right now where we are busier now than what we have ever been in the past. And I don't think that's tied um, specifically to um, anything to do with COVID-19. Um, it has to do with huge infrastructure projects that are underway right now and our, um, uh, whether it's preparation for the health authority expansion that's going to be here, or the Marconi campus building, uh, as well as another, uh, other initiatives that we've un undertaken. So it, it's, um, it's been quite demanding for us. We've all had to assume a, a little bit more um, responsibility. Um, but as far as our, the, you know, the impact, I think we're actually a little bit closer and we're doing a much better job sharing information because, um, because of having a couple of meetings a week uh, via Zoom, that's, that's closer than we've ever been uh, before. Uh, there would maybe be calls with one or two people on a call. Now everyone's there and everyone's sharing what's, what's going on. So um, that's been great for us. Um, the impact, uh, as far as our community go, communities go, has been, you know, it's been as different as each of our communities are. Um, so for, say, Member 2, which is kind of considered kind of an economic engine in, uh, in the CBRM, the Cape Breton, Victor uh, Cape Breton County, um, we've, we've had to, uh, after a period of about half a month, 
uh, a number of a huge number of people had to be laid off because a lot of our businesses are around. We have a trade and convention center. We have a hotel. We have restaurants. We have gaming facilities. Everything is about kind of service with the public and and. Uh, there was only so long that we could keep these these open and operating, right? And so, um, so it's been hugely impactful for our business operations uh, here in Member Two. But when I think about a community like Eskasoni that went, Eskasoni uh, First Nation that went on a complete lockdown, um, none of their community members were allowed out of their community. No one was allowed into their community. It was all very closely controlled. They've had a, a robust entrepreneur class there because there's about six, six and a half thousand people live in that community. And so um, because of their distance from Sydney or any other larger urban center, entrepreneurs have, uh, or the people in business development there have kind of developed kind of this network of businesses that provide services and stuff for the individuals there. So uh, their small businesses have, have thrived right? Their community business off have thrived. And they've actually had, um, well, it's not in the ICT sector, um, uh, as the first speaker was, uh, was talking about the impact that the, the growth that they've experienced, they've actually had to bring on more employees to provide services to uh, running groceries and deliveries and stuff like that, add security. So they've actually probably increased the number of people employed as their response to this, uh, to this pandemic. And it's been, I think I was mentioning in our conversation last week was what has really been impactful for me is to see what has been considered now essential. Mm -hmm. So grocery store workers, right? People at our drugstores, our truck drivers, right? And it seems like people, hairdressers, people who do your hair, right? Um, and it, it, they seem to be in these areas where they're kind of, they, they become essential um, but they're underappreciated and I think that they're undercompensated for what they do and and for us as a society to kind of have to rely on them at a time where I don't think they're recognized as much as they should be um, that has been hugely impactful for me I'll never look at the people at the Sobe store the same way again knowing that they really a lot of them didn't have a choice right mm -hmm. they were in having to do this and uh, and dealing with the very real fear of, a, of, of something that's sweeping the world. So um, that's kind of my little few minutes here as an introduction. Great, thank you. It's very, very, I, I think there's a new word for them. We call them uh, COVID warriors now. Uh, my brother actually is also a doctor back in India. So that's, that's how they are calling them as warriors. And I, I will get back uh, to you on, on that very particular question um, uh, around essential service and, and mm -hmm. which sectors are uh, growing or declining as a result of this, this crisis. I'll come back to that later, uh, Alex. Now, let yeah. me uh, go to uh, Sean. Um, I know he is, he is going to be participating in a virtual parliament in an hour. So that definitely is a new thing that he will be doing. But, but let's ask him. Uh, what what this crisis has meant uh, for him uh, personally, and and we have seen a lot of activity in in Ottawa in terms of policies and programs. So let's hear what what this this crisis has meant uh, uh, for him personally, but also from a federal government perspective. Uh, sure, and I could easily fill the remaining hour with an answer to that question, but I'll, I'll refrain from doing so for the benefit of everybody tuning in. Um, before I get to the question, let me first say uh, thank you to the Cody Institute for putting this together, Yugesh and Jamie in particular. This is phenomenal. Uh, I think one of the, um, the things I've learned about Cody over the past few years is that I've always held in my mind when I was a student on campus about what a great thing this is for the rest of the world to bring lessons about community development and the benefits of cooperatives, for example. Uh, but I think uh, th this is sort of an inflection point in the history of our society where we can start to take lessons from the Cody's work that we can apply right here in our own communities. Uh, so to the question, how, what, what has changed for me personally and, and professionally? Uh, on a personal level, I've experienced the same disruptions that so many other people have. Um, my four-year-old will occasionally come plant a kiss on me in the middle of a meeting that everybody gets to see. Um, I, I live typically in a, a world where I fly to Ottawa Monday, fly home Friday, and on the weekends, if there's an event with 10,000 people, I try to meet every single one of them. Uh, so I'm experiencing a level of social isolation I'm not accustomed to. And, and my wife tells me that our peanut butter and milk consumption has gone through the roof since I've been home. Uh, but uh, professionally, aside from the, these personal disruptions, 
this has been the most engaging and exciting time uh, I've ever experienced from a, a policy point of view, uh, but for all the wrong reasons. Um, the, uh, we, we are busier in my office than we've ever been, despite the fact that I'm not going to Ottawa, despite the fact that there are no community events to go to. And the reason is because the need amongst our community members is so great compared to where it ordinarily is. What I think this pandemic has done as much as anything it is shone a light on existing vulnerabilities. Uh, why did we not take more seriously the fact that gig workers didn't have paid sick leave before we got into this pandemic? Why didn't we realize that when a public health emergency arises, uh, childcare is going to disappear and disproportionately discriminate against women who are potentially uh, the, the sector that represent the biggest opportunity for economic growth for our nation going forward? Uh, there's a real interesting opportunity here, and I, I hope we get to dig into some of the emergency response later in this call, but there's also a real enormous opportunity for us to reconsider things that we previously took for, for, for granted. I think Alex mentioned uh, the um, uh, going to the barber or hairdressers. I know my wife's been cutting my hair at home for these Zoom meetings. Uh, but realistically, there, there's so much more that we always took for granted. Uh, why do big companies need to fill 50-story office buildings in downtown centers when the quality of life of their workers may actually be better if they're able to work from home on a more flexible schedule? There are thousands of basic questions like this. And I think if we miss the opportunity to build a framework that actually tries to identify the outcomes we hope to achieve on the back end of this recovery and transition, we will have missed the greatest opportunity to reform Canada, to provide assistance for those who need it, uh, that we will ever see in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. I think it's a great start and a lot of uh, sort of topics that, that we have touched upon. So let me do... Uh, uh, a couple of follow-up questions uh, from each one of you. And then we have actually started receiving questions from the audience. So I will actually start picking up some of the questions from the audience as well. But before actually, I really want to introduce the audience as well. So we actually had uh, close to 300 uh, participants uh, from all across the world, I think around 40 countries. Uh, I think 130 uh, from Canada and that re represented different sectors of the uh, of the economy people from the provincial government local government uh, uh, non profit sector business so they have all uh, tuned in internationally i think also we have a very um, a good mix uh, so we have people uh, representing community sectors community organizations uh, we have uh, uh, one person joining from our long term partner the self employed women's association in india uh, and uh, from sub saharan africa different organizations so i think it's a very good representation of business government uh, local government and, and civil society so i, I really welcome uh, all of you unfortunately because the way the way we have set up the uh, the zoom call we can't see you all all 300 but uh, type in your question we'll try to address as many as uh, as possible so let me actually kick start uh, by going back to maybe alex uh, and asking him that 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 very question around which uh, sectors of the economy uh, you think are, are affected uh, negatively where they're seeing decline? Maybe, maybe you, were, you were talking about the service industry, uh, the hospitality industry, tourism. Uh, Sean was talking about um, uh, the commercial real estate. Maybe that, that, that is not in so much use right now. So what are some of the sectors that are seeing some decline? But what are some of the sectors that are seeing uh, sort of the uh, uprise, like uh, more and more demand? So uh, with, starting with you, uh, Alex, can you, can you just give, give us a sense? Uh, and, and also maybe you can focus your, um, your, your answer um, on, the, on the local economy uh, in, in Nova Scotia, Atlantic Canada. Begin from there. Okay, um, you were froze. My screen was froze that entire question uh, oh, and, uh, until the end and you came to me immediately, which I was panicking uh, about. Um, so could you please uh, repeat the question for me? I, I actually got bumped off of the off and had to get back in again. So I think it's, it's the same question I asked you uh, when, when we talked last week. So which are the sector, I think, uh, what are uh, some of the changes you are seeing in the Nova Scotia economy, where you're seeing growth, uh, what shifts are you seeing? And okay. how they are impacted by COVID? Oh, and how's that infected by COVID? <laughs> um, well, um, here locally, um, well, I think, I think it's a phenomenon across Nova Scotia. Uh, a lot of our, um, a lot of our industries are still either resource-based, or uh, over the past uh, 10 years, we've seen uh, massive growth in tourism, 
uh, in that sector, uh, particularly here in Cape Britain. And so, um, as you can imagine, uh, with res travel restric restrictions in place, and um, we are seeing entire, entire seasons being shut down. So we have uh, last, I think it was last week or the week before, uh, the cruise ships were with the extension of the, the ban of cruise ships entering into um, Canadian waters, we've lost a cruise ship season, right? And, um, and for me, I'm thinking I feel much safer because that's the decision that our government has made. We have uh, community um, uh, interpretive uh, tourism products that there's no one there now. And they employ elders, they employ um, youth in them uh, from really from what would be now until October. Uh, and so um, those are huge when I think about the economic impact that that'll have on Eskasoni. Um, you know, that's going to be huge for them. Uh, it's going to be huge for us in member two because we started our own bus tours. Uh, where we have individuals from the community who are trained as interpreters and come through and drive, and we have we're driving traffic through some of the um, some of the um, the businesses that we have here, um, and we lose that opportunity to kind of educate the world about who and what we are, which I think um, has helped uh, because you know in member two the the motto of the community is welcoming the world, and I think that that has been uh, something that as as a community member here, we've harnessed that and it has informed our interactions, our eagerness to enter into partnerships. Um, and, and, and so it, that's, it's been significantly impactful that way. Um, one of the, and I think when we see growth in uh, the Nova Scotia economy, for me, when I look locally, we're seeing the explosive growth in, say, a company called Protocase, right, which is an advanced manufacturer, does a lot of work with space programs, aerospace industries, very, very niche, um, a, a niche market um, with the U.S. military and militaries throughout the world, space programs. Um, if they need a single component for something, this company will custom build it for them. And they have been early adapters of technology so that they can have clients just logging on saying what they're looking for an engineer at, at say nasa could say this is what we need and we need two of them by the end of the week and that will immediately come into someone at that plant and they'll be able to develop and design and go back and forth between the engineers at the other uh at the with their customer and then within a few days they'll have something built and shipped out and, uh, exactly to those specifications but within the past year they're now in their fourth expansion now so they're just, they're just keep building and building and building. And it's right in the center of Sydney, um, uh, located right beside where the steel plant used to be. And so for me, it's incredibly uh, hopeful seeing a, a, a company like that grow. Um, and uh, and, it, and it, 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 for me, it kind of demonstrates where the future is in advance for us. It's going to be growing our ICT sector. It's going to be supporting companies like Protocase that are advanced manufacturers uh, and very, very niche manufacturers, I think. Um, um, even companies like Halifax Biomedical, which are uh, they're a world leader in, in, in imaging, medical imaging, right? They're located here in Cape Britain, which, um, you know, I think that, that's fantastic. So, um, we have to see uh, and, and be part of this um, um, shift to uh, more technical and more um, that type of economy, kind of a STEM-based economy, um, in order for us to kind of balance out what's going to be that really sharp decline in tourism, right? Like we have exceptional tourism products here. Just the golfing alone on Cape Breton Island is driving hundreds and hundreds of people to our island every year but what happens when that shuts down and i think about the impact that that will have on inverness county which was growing exponentially right businesses popping up everywhere in support of a tourism product they had so for us as and when i think about kind of the the mi'kmaq people as a as a kind of people who have been here since the beginning of time um but historically underrepresented in the uh, nova scotia workforce um we are at a stage where we are still trying to create a 
in our youth the the thought that careers in STEM fields are a reality to them, right? And part of what we what we want to be able to do is 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 to build that because in the future we see there's going to be um, you know we do some some work with the Shared Services Canada and up to about a year ago I had no idea <laughs> what this group was and um, and so they provide IT support for all the federal government departments right? and they're looking to hire but their team members can join and be anywhere in the country so they could be someone living in Eskasoni and be part of a team that's handling projects for the rest of the country and still be able to work from home. So I, I think it was maybe, maybe Sean was talking about how this is going to transform our economy and we really have a chance to do something really innovative here. Um, and I think this is, this is, this is part, part of that, but we have to, we have so few members of our communities who have been, um, who have gone through any of the STEM fields and then can act as an inspiration to others to think that that's possible, right? So we're really challenged uh, there right now. So we have a lot of efforts in our office to kind of work with our post-secondary students, work with our high schools uh, to get people kind of making different decisions of what they're going, their career pathways um, and educational pathways will be. So um, it's an awful lot for us. And the reason why we're focusing there is that we have a, a, uh, a demographic wave, which is uh, exactly the opposite of what's happening in the rest of Canada, the, or at least in Atlantic yeah. Canada, 50% of our youth are under the age of 25, mm -hmm. right? So we have to do something for that group because we're driving them through educational pathways, university and college without providing, I don't feel we're providing them the right information where the careers of tomorrow are. So we have to harness this opportunity now to get that out so we can start directing people to where these careers are going to be, right? And so that if something like this does happen again, right, that we've got a highly educated group um, who can weather the storm a little bit better than, than others, right? So we're not there yet. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And I think I'll, I'll come back to uh, that particular uh, question around uh, around uh, skill development and, and what needs to uh, to happen uh, <clears throat> to, to match the, the demand and, and, and supply. But let me just quickly uh, go to Kelly um, on, on the same question, because Kelly, as uh, working in the in the transportation industry, you work across different industries, different sectors. So are you seeing uh, like anything uh, different than what uh, uh, what Alex described, like some some decline in terms of service, but some some more growth in, in technology sectors in Nova Scotia? Um, for us, uh, we definitely see a lot of what Alex is talking about. I think he he really he did a great job for all of us in, in summary and kind of summarizing what's happening in in I think Nova Scotia, but I think on the East Coast for sure. Um, for us, when I look at the challenges that um, you know that may exist for us, we are we have been designated and certainly recognized as an essential service, and I think that's important to recognize. Um, what people may not realize is that not every company. Uh, will haul um, essential service or essential goods. So we're seeing the growth on one side and the demand, and then we're seeing a bit of a decline on the other side. So COVID's been kind of unique in, uh, in, in our side in, in trying to make sure that we have the opportunities for people and they can still um, you know, have a good income and all the things that we want them to have, mm -hmm. but also recognizing that we're, um, you know, that we have both, uh, you know, kind of, kind of going on at the same time. Yeah. So as far as, um, as far as I think you would ask me about artificial intelligence as well, is that what you were asking me about? Um, yeah, so you see growth there as well in, in that um, side? In, on that side of it, we're doing an initiative with the uh, Future Skills Center. And that is focusing on uh, not, it's focusing on a virtual reality uh, simulator and training individuals, training drivers or professional drivers in um, being able to operate unique equipment and being able to try and see if we can upgrade their skills um, by a different way of doing it. Because we have automated trucks that we know are taught, they're talking about coming, um, we wanna have innovative ways to actually do training. And so we're doing an initiative actually with St. of X where we're um, researching what that difference is when people have access to virtual reality training and then when they come back out on the back end, how that actually enhances and improves their skills. Great. 
you know, I, um, I, I teach different courses at the Cody Institute and people from all across the world come and we take them to the field trips. And normally I take them to see dairy here, which actually is, is a big thing and they learn a lot. I take them to see uh, fishing industry uh, cooperatives. But today what I'm learning is there's like so much else that is happening in terms of uh, advanced technology. So maybe next time the class will go and, and, and see the advanced, uh, uh, the automation that uh, Alex was talking about, what you are doing in terms of virtual reality. There's so much actually happening within Nova Scotia. That's it's, it's yeah. great. So, uh, Sean, uh, uh, to you. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, uh, from uh, like um, so. So, if um, if you look at, we, we learn a little bit about Nova Scotia, but nationally, and 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 you are very connected uh, uh, to policy making right now. Do you see uh, any 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 particular uh, sectors where um, uh, where you see more investments going, uh, more growth happening? Um, yeah, and I think it's it's really fascinating to me because uh, growth is really driven by um, so solutions to problems that people have not figured out before. Uh, we're in a unique period of time right now because the, the problems we're facing do not reflect um, a, a typical economic crisis in the sense that uh, there is both a, at, at risk of uh, getting away from kitchen table talk, um, th there's both a supply, pressure on both the supply and demand side of the equation for any industry that involves people getting in the same room. Uh, uh, there are some industries that have not been dramatically impacted, uh, but if you're dealing with, with a restaurant, uh, you, you both have a restaurant owner who's been shut down by the government in many cases, and you have a public who is afraid of showing up and actually purchasing products. Uh, this is a, a complete disaster for businesses right across Canada. And, and what complicates it further is that it's happening in every community across Canada at the exact same time. Uh, so there's not an ability for people to go to the next community to get the service that they used to rely on. Uh, so it's created a, a downward pressure on so many industries that have been canvassed here, not just tourism and, and travel uh, and hospitality. Um, look, obvious challenges with the long-term care situation in Canada right now. Uh, but certainly there's opportunities as well, some short-term, some long-term. So in the short term, uh, anybody who was able to pivot to produce uh, personal protective equipment uh, is cannot fill the orders that are coming their way. Uh, businesses that have adapted and continue to pri provide services online. My God, I, I wish I had the foresight to have bought stock and online grocery orders uh, a few months back. Um, there, there are certain things like that where people have figured out solutions uh, to some of these, um, uh, th these great problems. So where, where I'm looking uh, in the future, what are, what are these sort of medium term opportunities? Uh, where can people provide a service digitally or virtually that used to be a person-to-person -person, person -person exchange? Uh, I'm thinking about um, redundancies that we can add to our supply chains. Um, Nova Scotia, for example, is the least food secure uh, province in, in our country, if you exclude the territories. Uh, and one of the things that I, I'm seeing is there is an enormous appetite not just to purchase from local producers, uh, but to have governments support those producers so they can be there should there be a, a shock to the supply chain in the future. Uh, it's really a fascinating thing that you're, you're seeing. And, and I think right now people are, are seeing more and more the importance of civil society and nonprofits in our communities. Uh, if you look at, um, uh, to perhaps uh, draw attention to one of the uh, most pronounced uh, examples we've seen, um, with the changes with people being locked at home, and it's, it's really a shameful thing, um, the increase in domestic violence has been shocking. Uh, it's provided an opportunity for us to open our eyes to the fact that it, it was shocking before the pandemic. And by supporting these civil society actors, we're actually going to be able to do a, get more bang for the buck for the quality of life for an individual citizen living in our communities. Um, there's some other patterns. I, again, I could talk all day. Uh, Nova Scotia real estate and rural communities is flying off the shelf as long as it's in a community that has access to high-speed internet. And I'm talking right now to certain employers in my own community where their staff who live in town are able to work. And their staff who live in the country that don't have access to the internet are collecting the CERB because, sorry, for those who aren't from Canada, it's the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. It's a personal income support. And they're not pro uh, being productive uh, members of their, their company or business because they don't have access. So I think the, in the future, um, if you can find a way to provide services without being face-to-face -face or enable people to work from home, there's going to be enormous opportunities for us to transform and it would be a real shame if we missed the boat. Yeah, 
Absolutely right. I think uh, my family is also in Antigonish. I think we have seen our family doctor more on, on telephone than we have seen her face to face. And on that point, I actually, I spoke with the Prime Minister personally about this exact issue yesterday. And I know Jamie's um, a partner is a, a doctor in town who would probably agree with me on this. If there was some way to create a national accreditation across Canada, um, the opportunities for virtual health care, if we can get physicians from outside of province to do the simple things through a Zoom meeting or a Skype call, my goodness, if we don't embrace virtual health, we are not going to extend access to primary care to everyone in our province. So we may as well get on with it. Yeah. Yes. So let me, uh, let me switch gears just, uh, just a little bit. No, um, uh, you might have heard this phrase that uh, we are all uh, in this storm, but we are in different boats. And the kind of boat we are in uh, determines the kind of impact we will have. So I, I want to ask you, uh, uh, Linda, uh, we have heard a lot about, okay, digital uh, technologies are coming, uh, bringing a lot of opportunities. But we also understand uh, even globally that there is a digital divide. Not everybody has the same access to uh, the, the opportunities. So uh, if, if you can throw some light and, and with, with uh, the uh, uh, immense amount of work you have done with the, with the African Nova Scotian and other um, uh, communities uh, in the region. If you can just tell us like some of the, 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 the barriers that you, you, you address on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, and what uh, this particular um, crisis has, has meant for you. Has, has those further intensified or has, has this crisis uh, thrown some more light on those? So just some perspective on that would be, would be great, Linda. Yes, um, historically in this province, there's been um, definitely underrepresentation of racialized groups, particularly Black Nova Scotians and, and Aboriginal people from um, entering into um, employment opportunities. Um, we were behind in our education and, and skills to compete in those arenas. And for those who do have the skills and the um, qualifications to complete, they face with the, they're faced with the barriers of racism. Um, so that there's a gap there, and the gap, what we see COVID presenting is a further gap. We see that we're going to be further behind. The, uh, the rate of unemployment for, um, in the black community is much greater than that of the, the um, just in the general population. Um, and we just see, we see that as just broadening. Um, we see the numbers of, um, persons in the black community la lacking, they're just not meeting, as, they're not able to meet their needs, the ba their basic needs because of these gaps and the racism that they face. We also see, have seen an increase in um, black violence, as we know. Um, um, and, and what is, it equates to is just um, more of a, paralyzing impact on black communities, their inability to thrive, um, and they're just further and further behind. Also with youth, we see youth um, have been really hit hard by COVID. Um, they, most of the youth were in positions in um, grocery stores and fast food chains, and we know that they've been impacted. And so they've been thrown out of their part-time work, students have been. So these are basically the things that we see as um, impacting the black community. I think these ills were always there, these barriers were always there, but we think that it's been, it's highlighted now and it's been, um, it, it's increasing and it will have a negative, um, it will see a negative impact um, as we move forward and we'll see that broaden more and more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, you know, there are a lot of questions uh, coming in uh, and, and Jamie, I would need your help too because I'm, I'm monitoring some, but just keep an eye. So let me start, uh, let me pick up some questions. I will read the question and um, whosoever wants to actually answer it uh, can, can, can just like go, go ahead and answer. So the first one is, is, is there really going to be a turning point for the conditions of workers on the front line? For example, the major grocery stores have already reduced the dollar to hour wage of their staff. So for them, life is already back to pre-COVID levels. So basically, is, is, was COVID a, a passing shower and, and we are back to uh, what you call a normal again? 
who would like to go? Yeah, Sean, go ahead. Sure. F fantastic question. Obviously, that's been in the news and there's some pressure to have the executives of major grocery chains testify about this uh, before uh, parliamentary committees. Uh, right now, one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Nate Erskine-Smith, uh, is calling for that publicly. Um, the, uh, so it, I, I hesitate to say um, unequivocally, no, a new page has turned because uh, it, it's not as though there's one actor who's responsible to implement this kind of change. Uh, but I certainly hope that's the case. I, I know the federal government in terms of supporting frontline workers is a bit limited in, in its um, tools jurisdictionally only because typically provinces deal with things like um, uh, minimum wage, uh, they deal with um, uh, labor relations, uh, th things like that that really do speak to frontline folks. But one of the opportunities that I, I see fr from this entire um, forced experiment uh, is that the, the pandemic has disproportionately and negatively impacted people who were already vulnerable. And uh, those people needed supports before the pandemic came about. If I'm looking right now, where do we turn our mind to? Is we're, we're trying, there's an active conversation. I spoke with the minister this morning about how do we transition uh, away from the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which was just extended by, by eight weeks just moments ago. Um, this, uh, yeah, breaking news on the call here. Uh, but there's going to be a, a long-term question that we have to ask ourselves. What supports are we going to put in place that actually help vulnerable people, whether it's because of their socioeconomic status, their uh, racial or ethnic background, or a history of discrimination, or their personal life experience? Uh, why do we put them through this Byzantine structure of social supports that end up giving them hundreds of dollars to live on a month, and, and maybe a bit more if they can tap into certain other programs? Where I see the biggest opportunity is to say, um, how can we, if you turn your mind to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that pyramid we probably learned about in junior high, how do we provide the bottom few rungs for everyone? How do we make sure that we work with provincial social assistance programs so that we are not condemning people because of the skin or community they were born into a life in poverty? It is maddening that we see some people uh, who didn't win a lottery of birth be discriminated against their entire life. And it is holding everybody back, even people who look like me, because my community is not as strong if the most vulnerable people are not supported. So if I'm looking, where's the biggest opportunity to support people who often end up in minimum wage jobs is not simply to go after the, uh, the grocery stores to pay them more. It's to put a base level of social supports in place so that everyone will, uh, it, automatically, by virtue of living in Canada, benefit from a quality of life that will allow them to make something of themselves if they're willing to work toward it. Uh, so that's where I'm kind of turning my mind to from a policy point of view right now. Um, the essential workers, I think, highlight the problem, but tackling that one angle of it is going to make us feel good for a couple of months, and then we'll realize that $16 an hour still isn't very much to live on. Uh, so that, that's the, the approach that I'm trying to figure out right now. How do we put that income support in place so that everyone can access a quality of life that is uh, the, the minimum standard we should expect uh, for someone who's uh, living in Canada? Yeah, yeah. And I think you, you touched upon uh, this question and that actually uh, uh, goes back to the point you earlier made. And there are a lot of questions on, on this particular topic. And it is on basic income support. So let's hear from all the panelists, actually. Just because there can be very passionate argument on the both sides uh, if you look at the global debate. So, um, who wants to start? Uh, Kelly, basic income support, or you call it basic universal income. <laughs> okay, so you're asking me if I support that or? What are your views? That's the um, question is, yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, I think I think Sean kind of summarized it perfectly um, in that we do need to have, uh, there needs to be, we need to look at it. I mean, we look at essential services, we look at, you know, different opportunities and, you know, even during uh, the height of the pandemic, I mean, you know, it wasn't anything to see uh, grocery stores hiring, you know, trying to hire people even for the short term for, uh, you know, but they couldn't get people. Uh, because of the, you know, of, of the challenges that they were going to face. And of course, was the dollar, were the dollars enough um, to actually influence them? So I think that, you know, absolutely, you know, a basic income, I think it has to increase, um, you know, just looking at the cost of living and all of the things that, uh, you know, that we're facing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Linda? 
Yes, I agree. We definitely need a basic living wage. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen um, some grocery stores capped minimum, minimum wage to attract people to the positions that they needed them to fill during COVID. Mm -hmm. And now we're hearing that some grocery stores are clawing that back yes. now that things are opening up. And that's disturbing. Another thing that we did see during COVID, people that normally would not have the access to those positions because they were maybe concerned, maybe have been considered a little uh, risky, um, they were getting the positions. People from the black community, people that may have intellectual disabilities, these people were getting the positions. And I'm wondering what's gonna to happen to those people after COVID? I think they're gonna be thrown out of work. And for those who do remain, they're certainly going to be making a lot less money. And you know that underlines the seriousness of um, what's going on in the world of work for people from marginalized groups. And that we have to really do, we need to work on putting things in place that prevent these things from happening to people. And to really take a good, long, hard look at the type of work that people are doing and the value that's placed on that work the dollar value that's placed on that work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alex? Um, listen, I have uh, found myself all over the political spectrum uh, throughout my life. And um, one of the arguments that often gets made is that um, this will uh, be a, have a negative impact on our economy and it'll be a disincentive for individuals uh, to get out and, and work. And um, what they fail to mention in that is that uh, for lower income people, almost 80% uh, of their benefits that they would get, get turned directly back into the economy for the purchases of goods and services, right? And these are things that were, this is just on a regular basis, Never mind if you gave, uh, if there was some uh, a, a universal basic income there. It's not that they're gonna be hoarding it away in offshore accounts uh, somewhere waiting to retire early, you know, by the time they're 40 years old, this gets turned right back into the economy. Um, and to think that um, in a country as prosperous as Canada, that um, some, uh, that enhancement of that basic safety net um, isn't possible. I think it's, it's almost criminal to think that way. You just have to take a look at countries where that isn't the case and just see the social havoc that is being wreaked. I mean, we have lots of room for improvement in this country, but we have certainly done a much better job than, uh, than others. And I'm thinking about our neighbors to the South right now. And it's interesting, I was listening to Linda and, and talking about, because a lot of times there's a lot of parallels between our experiences between the indigenous community and the African Nova Scotian community. And one of the things that uh, appeals to me about a universal basic income is because of our connection to the labor force has been tenuous um, at best. Um, and then when we put in tremendous as much effort and resource into getting people um, upskilled uh, so that they can uh, in some way connect to the labor force, um, because of our lack of experience and we haven't been there long enough, um, we're still kind of, we're the last in and the first out when things turn down, when there's slowdowns, right? And so something like this, um, a, a benefit like this would uh, allow us to keep, uh, maybe allow us to pay our out of work dues so that if we're doing unionized work that we can uh, be eligible for a call up uh, for work, right? Um, you know, I just, I just think that, um, I, I think that um, these things on a broad, for a, uh, the broader population are fantastic. They would be a particular uh, benefit to uh, to under underrepresented groups. And there's lots of room for innovation, not just with, you know, uh, with um, like things like a like a universal basic income. I, I think about the work that uh, Jamie's group did and um, with the Now program, and think about the innovation around uh, allowing groups that provide services for underrepresented people kind of design and develop training to employment initiatives based on their own experience and expertise to develop working with these communities um, has been hugely impactful because you know we understand that um, that um, you know the what we need from underrepresented groups is not the same 
as groups that are from the from uh, who are uh, non-indigenous, non-African, Nova Scotian, right? We have to be provided with more skills. We have to link those skills to longer work terms so that we're of more value to the employers in Nova Scotia so they won't look to get rid of us quickly because they'll see the value that we could have in their workplace. So, you know, we need to, there needs to be a lot of innovation everywhere. Uh, and I think this is a great catalyst to kind of open that up to, uh, to some broader discussions, right? And to understand that one fix doesn't work for everybody. Great. And if this and can I just add, um, yeah. a lot of people from the black communities and native communities, they don't see themselves there. It, it, often places of employment don't reflect the community. They don't see themselves reflected there. So very often they would never even consider applying for employment in certain areas. So that is a, a barrier that often we try to educate employers around through our work um, and try to support people through. But it's, it's a very real barrier for people who are uh, racialized communities. We can't imagine what's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's interesting, uh, Alex, you make, uh, you make the point that if you have a, a basic minimum income, then uh, upskilling and reskilling uh, becomes uh, easier or, or it opens up new opportunities for you. But if you are yeah. just uh, busy in, in, in making the, the ends meet, then you, you don't get those opportunities to be skilled enough. Skill. Okay, Sean, uh, you want to add anything um, on, on yeah, this? this I, of, yeah. Thank you. This is a fascinating conversation and a, and a very important topic. I think there's, um, uh, I, I think we're, we're very bad. First, I'll talk about the cost of something. I think if you wanted to do a universal basic income, which I do not think is a good idea, uh, it would roughly double the amount of money that the government of Canada spends on everything else combined together. And I don't think it's a good idea. A, well, sure, it would be very expensive, but it would be very poorly targeted. There's no reason somebody earning $250,000 a year needs any kind of support to have a basic income. We also want to make sure that whatever policy is put in place does continue to incentivize productivity. Typically, mo most studies that have been done on this, though nobody's got a complete data set, uh, would show that there is a small leg on productivity, but huge social returns if you lift someone out of, out of poverty. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, I, I think you could pair it with a little bit of nuance, which would not be hard. There's models in existing programs we could use that would say, we're going to give you support but we're also going to make sure that you're always better off if you work as well in addition to that support. It's not hard to do. Working while on claim through the EF program through the EI system is an excellent, excellent illustrative example. So where does this leave me? I, I think it takes me to a conversation not about a universal basic income, but about a guaranteed living wage, which is I think what Linda hit on in her, uh, her opening remarks on this issue. And I think she was spot on. Um, there's, we're, we're so bad, even though I just talked about the costs, to ignore the benefits uh, of these, uh, these measures as well, because we, as, we assume that the, the society we live in is somehow um, a, a natural phenomenon. Uh, there's nothing natural uh, about poverty when you're dealing with an advanced economy. The social conditions people live in is not the result of a, a flaw in our system. It is the result of a design in our system that has ignored the voices of people during the construction of those systems. Uh, and those people are now living without the benefits that other people enjoy. One of the things that I think we can do is have a serious conversation about which programs we can eliminate to bring in a guaranteed living wage. I'm thinking of social assistance, for example, to be a great place to start and really reform what, what welfare looks like in Canada. Um, certainly there's other programs like EI that serve a separate purpose. We would probably want to remain in place, but I think it's a terrific time to have this conversation. As long as we avoid duplication, as long as we target support to people who actually have need and we incentivize people to be productive, regardless of whether they're receiving a benefit or not, there's huge opportunities right now at this moment in history to have a conversation. And I never thought we would be here. Uh, but there is right now an opportunity to have this conversation that might, might lead us somewhere productive. And, and I'm so thrilled to have an opportunity to talk about uh, bright people like the ones on this panel today about such an important topic. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question for, for Linda. Uh, and then I know, um, Sean, you have to go. So then one question for you so that, so that you're free to go. So first for you, Linda, uh, uh, potential. <clears throat> uh, we are seeing Black Lives Matter marches all over the world. Nova Scotia is not immune to racism. 
how can racial equality be ensured as the future of work is created? I think education is the key. Conversation and education is the key to it, to being able to have some middle ground there. Employers um, need to be open to the idea that, first of all, racism does exist. And in the workplace, there's a, there's, um, a lot of um, microaggressions in terms of racism that people have to um, deal with on a daily basis in the, in the world of employment. People are not being hired in positions because of racism. And people are suffering at work due to racism. Um, racism, um, you know, causes a lot of stress and stress um, produced illnesses in black populations. And these conversations really have to happen. Racism, the acts of violence of racism aren't always with a gun or a knife. Sometimes it's in conversations in being excluded, being excluded, and to be devalued in the workplace. Um, you know, just to be able to support people through that, we need to work closely in community. We need to bring supports and resources into community because there's a distrust, there's an element of distrust in black community in terms of what is being said, how things are going to go, what can be expected. And it's just based on historical experiences. Uh, I, I wonder if, yeah, Kelly, you have, you have your hand up, please. Yeah, um, just to tag on to that, I think there's also a piece that goes to the, uh, to the employer side as well. Um, when we look at, um, I look at the, um, the NOW initiative that we did, New Opportunities for Work, and we focused on um, increasing the number of underrepresented people that were in the sector and certainly not, um, you know, just one area. So I, I don't want to say that I, I understand certainly by any means um, from Melinda's perspective, but definitely one of the things that we learned from that initiative was that employers needed to be educated and needed to have barriers removed for them as well. I think that one of the outcomes that we saw um, with the initiative, one of the benefits was once we were removing barriers or challenges, the, the employers now see all the opportunities that exist for them. So I think that it's a cohesive um, you know, effort that happens. I think that the work that Linda and her team do is so critical. And I think for us, from a sector council perspective, to be able to open the doors to those employers, that's where we found um, a great deal of the success and the opportunity that was presented. And we wouldn't have been able to do that, I don't believe, if we hadn't had that opportunity through that initiative. So, um, so yeah, so, and I think the biggest thing that I can say is that um, it's been pleasantly surprising the number of employers who are now not only you know supporting underrepresented people coming into their sector but they're also the champions for it as well and so we're seeing that that's actually changing and increasing the number of people that are underrepresented in the sector so that's from our perspective it's definitely a really important and it's an important initiative yeah and i think the same participant actually had another question on the same topic how racial equality be ensured as the future of work is created and what is required for more equitable opportunities for black and first nation people so maybe alex if you want to uh, say something here um well I, you know i i sit and i think about the um at times i feel um i feel somewhat um well, this, this is a tough one. So we had a, um, I look at the problem uh, that exists or the situation that exists. And I, I think Sean was talking about kind of, um, he had mentioned something before about kind of companies that are going to be successful or kind of these ones that can be, that are innovative early and offer solutions. And part of the reason why I think our office has been successful over the years is that we just haven't highlighted what the problem is we've come with solutions and uh, for many employers uh, government departments they don't know how to go about uh, engaging uh, effectively with our communities um, they don't know how to implement engagement plans and inclusion in their workplace 
and so, um, you know, at some levels, we find that we're having to work with industry to develop those solutions for them. Um, and we're having success that way. But, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, the, the, the reason industry is approaching us is that we've also worked with government, both, at, say, with our, our good friends of Public Services and Procurement Canada, uh, about shaping policy that impacts the ways they, they tender for goods and services that include uh, the requirement for there to be Indigenous engagement. And this is what Indigenous engagement means. So, you know, aside from going through several levels of vetting, you know, what starts off with um, the language that we provide them with, um, you know, it does get, because I think there's, there's concern with that, um, uh, it does get it does get kind of watered down a little bit, but we still end up with something that is driving employers to this. They're saying to be part of this, whether it's a provincial infrastructure project or a federal one, this is we know that we have to engage now. So we're that's why we're so busy right now. That's why our office is so busy now and trying to ensure that we're doing the right matching up. But it, it's it's um our success has become influencing government to change policy to require that involvement. And I say that these, this didn't happen overnight. This is, you know, going, been going on in Nova Scotia for, for years and years and years. Um, but this is one way we can, one way we can impact that. And eventually we'll get to the point where we will have uh, to meet these demands and needs. We will have a skilled, experienced workforce uh, from all different underrepresented groups. Hopefully, Linda, we get there. I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime, maybe in yours, uh, but it's it's a long journey. And then we're also burdened with making sure that our uh, community members understand what the culture of the workplace is outside of their own community, because it is very distinct and very different. So um, we have to educate uh, employers. We have to say, even on a construction site, like, we have been working with people in the trades for quite some time and uh, we had an incident at a, at a work site where uh, in our communities, there's a couple of ways we uh, very generalized uh, indigenous people, we especially make Mo, we do not like conflict and it takes someone to have an incredible amount of confidence in themselves to, uh, to um, face something that is overtly racist in the workplace and be comfortable enough with the skill that they have and the work that they've done and the relationships with the people around them that there won't be a negative impact on them. We also have individuals who, who ghost a situation, which is essentially they'll just stop coming into work. It may manifest itself in kind of being late, maybe make, missing a shift here and there, and eventually they end up being terminated by the employer. Well, we had an incident where, uh, where comments being made in the workplace were portrayed to us as kind of, it's just the culture of the workplace. Everyone gets teased, everyone has to go through this. And, and you know, I think for some people who say 90% of a trade is made up of non-Indigenous and, and, and uh, people who aren't from underrepresented groups, for them, they approach that joking through a completely different lens than what an Indigenous person would. The very first thing that goes through is not whole, I'm just getting teased by my colleagues. It is because I am the one that's different in this workplace, and that's why this is happening. And it's in it. It's it takes a very unique skill set of individuals, uh, interpersonal skills, to understand and be able to talk yourself out of that, and and to be able to persevere because it does build up on you. So we're having to educate government, we're having to educate uh, senior management with companies, and we're having to come up with programs that are there that are something that is palatable and understandable for people kind of actually working on the ground. And we're having to put kind of uh, designate people in work sites who are indigenous as kind of the person who you can go to. That's your champion in the workplace if you're experiencing anything because often employers and their feedback to us is, well, someone just stopped showing up and you know, there's only so much we can do before we have to replace them, right? Mm -hmm. So th there are a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges, in it, but uh, so much opportunity to change things. And just think about the burden of having to be the ambassador for your racial group. Mm -hmm every workplace you go into.
mm -hmm. right? And that doesn't just happen at kind of the entry level construction anywhere. I sit on boards where I'm the only person. Mm -hmm. And that's striking for me at this time that that's the case, right? So there's lots of room for improvement. We'll get there. Yes, and just to add, Alex, what you what you told me uh, last week. Uh, so when we talk about future of work and future of workers, um, millennials, uh, as they, we call them, they will be the future workers, right? Is is the young people, the fifty percent young people that you talked about? And one thing you told me last week was that, uh, okay, there are opportunities in terms of new technologies and and uh, the growth in these sectors in Nova Scotia, but if you don't picture yourself there doing that kind of job. Right now, you don't, uh, you don't see yourself that you can do that job, then you don't actually go for it. So I think the one, one sort of idea or suggestion you had that, okay, we, we need to actually create awareness. You need to uh, uh, have role models for, for, for them to actually look and, and aspire uh, to be that, uh, that person who might be uh, an immigrant worker right now. So yeah. that, that will always, I think, I think that was a suggestion that you gave last week. I know, um, uh, Sean, you have to go. Uh, I must ask you one question before you go. And, and I, I know we have actually um, um, participants from all across the world. So let's take this discussion to uh, sort of a bigger challenge um, uh, uh, that workers um, everywhere um, are increasingly facing is, is, is that of the job displacement as a result of emerging technology, okay? So perhaps uh, we can start uh, with you, Sean. Uh, what's your perspective on this, this from a federal government perspective? Um, sh sure, uh, Yogesh, if I may, just before I answer that question, um, something Alex said has just stuck with me and it's been on my mind for, for the last number of weeks. Um, Alex, it is not fair that you and people in your community have to be the ambassador for something so basic as equality. And I feel like if I'm the, um, the, the white man on this panel, and it's actually, I, I'm glad that I'm the only one, by the way, thank you to the organizers for bringing a diverse range of voices. Um, I would feel, I, I would be remiss if, if I didn't offer comments because I think the, the, this discussion needs more people who look like me speaking up and marching in the streets. Uh, and, and more black and indigenous and, and Canadians living di with disabilities on national news broadcasts and in, in positions of authority from the clerk from the municipal office to the prime minister of Canada. Um, frankly, it's, it's an emotional thing. The last three weeks, the last three weekends, I woke up and I, I get up earlier than everybody else in my house. I put the coffee on and I look at the news. The last three weekends, the lead story has been another uh, person of color who's been killed after an interaction with the police. It, it, how am I supposed to tell my four-year-old that our neighbors are more likely to die uh, at the hands of the state because of the color of their skin? I remember when I was eight years old, Henderson Paris came to my school, uh, a local champion for racial equality. He started the run against racism, which has become a massive event, now the marathon of respect and equality. I learned about the origins of the run against racism and I thought that racism had ended. I thought that the run against racism was to commemorate the successful victory over inequality. Um, boy, was I wrong. Uh, here we are uh, 25, 30 years later, uh, and I'm waking up every Saturday morning, uh, and, and I can't imagine what it must be like for someone who says that could be me next time. I know that's not gonna be me. I don't get pulled over like Chief Adam does because uh, a sticker on my license plate is expired. I have worked with Chief Adam on a conservation project with the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. He is a good man who cares deeply about his community and did not deserve to be abused the way he was. Chantal Moore does not deserve to be dead right now. George Floyd should be alive in Minneapolis right now. It's so frustrating because in Canada, we have embedded in our constitutions the right to life, liberty, and security of the person and the right to be treated equally before the law. If those rights are written in our laws but not enjoyed in our communities, then our constitution is not worth the paper that it is written on. It is, um, it is so, so maddening. Uh, what can we do about these things? Uh, my God, let, let's mandate that our government and the positions of authority actually look like the country that we live in. Let's make sure, we, we know, this is indisputable, that corporate boards that have at least 30% women 
on their boards make more money than companies that have fewer than 30% women. I expect you would find the same thing is true if you applied that to ind indigenous communities and black communities, but there are not enough people from racialized con uh, communities on corporate boards in Canada to actually understand whether that's true or not because the data sample is too small. We can change these things. We should change these things. Quite frankly, it bringing underrepresented groups into the workforce the same way that white men are in the workforce is a much bigger opportunity for growth than trying to make it easier for white men who earn $100,000 to earn $200,000 a year. This is not rocket science. This is obvious and basic humanity. And I don't understand uh, why people can't make this a priority. And I'm probably guilty of not making it a big enough priority because I've become distracted with whatever the a controversial issue of the day is. Uh, but it now being the time to discuss this issue in the public because the streets are speaking, we can't miss this opportunity. I had to get that out because I don't think it's fair to leave the question of equality to uh, the women and people from black and indigenous communities on this panel. And I wanted to add my voice to it to say I'm standing alongside you. To your question about the displacement of tech, uh, technology displacing workers across Canada, it's happening all over the world. Um, I think we have to come overcome the notion that this is um, completely within our choice. Uh, globalization is a social fact, whether we like it or not. Uh, innovation and techno technological development is a social fact, whether we like it or not. I actually happen to like it. I think it increases the quality and standard of life that uh, Canadians and, and citizens of the world enjoy. Uh, and I think the trick is, is to manage that kind of innovation and the growth that works for everyone. Left unchecked in our current system, if we pile money into innovation, uh, and we don't have a, a conversation about what we do with the benefits of the economic growth that that innovation creates, we will have done a great disservice to underrepresented groups and Canadians writ large. Frankly, if we train Canadians from diverse backgrounds to take part in the innovation economy, we're going to have a front end reward for people who are working in higher paying jobs, but we're also going to have greater, uh, a greater economy through which we can then reprofile some of the, uh, the tax dollars that are currently being spent in an ineffective way to target people who are actually experiencing need across Canada. So I think one of the big things that often is missed in these conversations is what are we going to do with tax policy? How do we pay for these things, both in terms of how we collect tax and how do we dole, dole out benefits? Uh, if we want to have a conversation about the innovation economy and globalization, or frankly, a guaranteed basic income, um, we need to talk about where that money is coming from, and it should not be coming from low-income people. I don't personally think we should be drawing too hard on businesses to promote growth. I think we need to have a serious, a serious conversation about ensuring not just Canadians, but people around the world who have been extremely fortunate financially to pay their fair share so we can extend the benefits of globalization to everyone rather than leaving workers behind, and that is precisely what a just transition is about. Perfect. You know, uh, uh... We have just like five minutes uh, left um, for this uh, webinar, but I think you touched upon a few things that, uh, uh, so first of all, this conversation is not ending today. I think we are planning to have at least five or six webinars like this on the, on the topic of future of work and, and future of workers on some of the issues that, that just uh, came up uh, during this conversation, be it uh, minimum basic income, uh, new and emerging technologies, just transition, all of that we will pick up as a topic and we are going to have five or six of these um, um, uh, during starting uh, um, now and going up to um, in, in the fall. Also, uh, we are actually starting a new course uh, exactly on future of work and future of workers, an online course in September, uh, and that is going to run for 12 weeks. And, and the model we are uh, uh, using is that uh, these are the practitioners, people who are working on these issues. Uh, they have their daytime jobs. So it's going to be an online course where you will have to commit a certain amount of time per week, but it's not going to be that, okay, you will spend all the time for two weeks in the classroom. It's not like that. So uh, that is also um, that we will offer um, um, at Cody. So uh, with that, uh, Jamie, let me hand it over back to you. Uh, if you can do a, sure. a, 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 a thank you, that would be really good. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you all so much. And uh, we certainly are grateful for everyone's participation in the panel today, the story um, that was able to be shared with us um, from Arija Eldarahali at the very beginning of the webinar. 
um, all of your experiences and uh, insights are very important for all of us to be hearing this morning. And uh, certainly uh, from me, it's been a tremendous opportunity to work with all of you for the past three years. And um, so grateful that we've had this opportunity to come together. I, as we wrap up, we have uh, three minutes remaining. I would be grateful if, um, now I know Sean, you might have to, to leave. Uh, so uh, I'll hand the question uh, over to Linda, Kelly and Alex. But if you think about the impacts of COVID-19, the current moment that we're in the context of uh, the current dialogue around uh, anti-racist movements at this time, you know, what do you believe is the greatest opportunity and in innovation that we can be looking to as we lean into the future of work and workers? And uh, whoever would like to respond first, please, please go for it. I think the greatest opportunity that has presented itself recently is um, conversation and open dialogue about the topic of um, anti-racism, um, and violence that, uh, against black people in um, our communities. That, you know, everyone's talking about it, everybody's marching for it. But I think the challenge will be, you know, people putting their money where their mouth is, I think to carry it into the workplace, to carry it into your homes and into communities, to keep those conversations alive and meaningful and have action coming from those conversations. Thank you so much. Kelly, Alex? Um, I think that definitely, I think it's the action part now. I think that's gonna be the most important piece. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of us have, have said, and you know, we feel that, um, you know, outrage and opportunity. And I think that we have to be prepared to move forward and to, um, you know, to see our employers providing those opportunities that we wanna see them provide and, uh, and really change the dialogue uh, that's sitting at those tables um, you know, regardless of what that might be, but just definitely being, and being present, being present in those conversations and, and keeping people accountable. Thank you, Kelly. Alex, over to yeah. you. Um, boy, <laughs> um, the impact, uh, I mean, some of the, I think with COVID-19 and its impact on say some of the, the movements that we, we see right now is, um, is people having, access to information, uh, some good, uh, some not so good. Um, the ability to meet almost immediately and engage in uh, dialogue like we're having now, um, I think has, um, has uh, amplified the message that change is required. Um, I think that uh, from my perspective, I'm seeing more people acknowledge that this is a reality and um, that we aren't exaggerating based on uh, some extreme isolated cases. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the technology that has brought us together now, as well as the message getting out and um, I think is awakening employers uh, to this uh, this message, I think our educational institutions have done a um, a tremendous job at least uh, helping us provide a voice and and engaging people from underrepresented groups to be involved and have try and have an impact on the the world that we live in um, but we have a lot of a lot of work to do um, you know, I was thinking about the, the, the language of inclusion that the, the province of Nova Scotia has been working on, and it's taken so long to come up with the, the exact precise language to ensure that there's going to be um, engagement of underrepresented groups in the health authority projects that are going on. And I finally got a chance to take a look at it. And, um, and so the language is excellent, but I go like... Um, the, the target that goes along with it, um, which is really where the work needs to be done. Um, it's, you know, on our health authority projects, it's going to be fine for 90% of the workforce to be made up of non underrepresented groups. So in that 10% representation on our projects, we have 
women who are over half of the population, African Nova Scotians, newcomers, and indigenous people. And I walked away going, how does that decision get made? And I immediately went to how many of us are around the table who are from those groups who would challenge that. And I don't know of any underrepresented people who were sitting around that table helping come up with that. Uh, maybe, and, and, and for me, the language is fine. It's beautiful, the language is great. Sean was talking about the constitution being a beautiful document, but if it doesn't have an impact in the day-to-day -day lives of people across the country, then what does it mean? And I look at language of, a language of inclusion without a mechanism to ensure that it takes place and that we are satisfied with that. The groups it's supposed to be speaking for or providing opportunity mm -hmm. to. Um, you know, in an age where we can have a Zoom call and have a session like this and have over 300 people participating worldwide, how can we not have five or six groups involved in a discussion about something that so dramatically can impact them and make a huge impact in their communities, yeah. right? Sorry. Thank you. Um, Please don't apologize. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you again to all of our panelists. It's, um, it's wonderful to be here with you. I wish we were together, all of us uh, together in a space right now, but it's wonderful to see your faces. It's amazing to see the conversations, the questions, the gratitude that's being expressed uh, through the chat. Uh, we are going to be very pleased to be able to share a recording of this webinar out to folks. As uh, Yogesh has mentioned, uh, there will be ongoing conversations around the future of work and workers, and we're very uh, specific around that. This is about the workers, the people that are going to be engaged in those skills development and looking at the entrepreneurial opportunities, whether it's in uh, precarious work, it's in more traditional environments, but also creating the new possibilities um, for folks as we continue to move forward. So uh, we certainly, from the Cody Institute, from the Center for Employment Innovation at St. Evex University, thank you. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you all very soon, and uh, we're just grateful to be here with you all today. So thank you very much. I think it is a bit of a call to action to every single one of us around what is it that we can do ourselves with our families and communities with our employers and organizations to do better. And thank you so much for getting us off on such a great start. Hey, Have Jimmy. a wonderful day. Give me the survey. Just tell me about the Yes. Survey. and. We, the, the, the little pieces, we do have a survey. We would love for you to fill out the survey and give us some feedback as we continue to develop our webinars and as we walk towards our future work and worker certificate being offered in November. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.